On May 6th, 1765, pack horses and drivers were assaulted at Roland Harris's land by 30 black boys with blackened faces. The drivers were whipped, several pack horses killed or wounded, and their saddles and blankets were burned. Grant released Sergeant McGlasson with another squad onto the settlement in which the Highlander went on a prowl for black boys. With a black boy prisoner in tow, McGlasson's squad arrives at the Widow Bar House when a shot rings out from the woods. After a Highlander fired his rifle without order, a barrage began to fly from the rifles of the black boys, numbering 70 or 80 strong. The Highlanders returned fire and retreated to cover inside the Widow Bar's cabin. After an hour-long firefight, a countryman approached the cabin and told the sergeant that the men in the woods wished for him to release his prisoners, and if he did not, the Highlanders were not going to make it back to Fort Loudoun. Being outnumbered and low on ammo, the sergeant gave up his prisoners and returned safely to Fort Loudoun unmolested by the black boys. One black boy was wounded in the Battle of the Widow Bars and Justice William Smith issued an arrest warrant for Sergeant McGlasson for the wounded man. On May 10th, Fort Loudon was surrounded by 200 armed frontiersmen who was led by James Smith and three justices of the peace. Smith and his justices demanded access to Spears cargo to inspect it for warlike goods, in which Lieutenant Grant refused, citing the passes he received from General Bouquet and the commander at Fort Pitt. He permitted a justice to inspect the goods the following week, when a mob of rioters were not threatening him. But this was unacceptable to Justice William Smith, citing that the general's orders did not apply to him and that the passes Grant had would not do if not also accompanied by a magistrate pass from the residents of Cumberland County. William Smith put civil law over military law or military rules by saying that the province of Pennsylvania built these roads and this fort so they are not the king's property to do as he wished with. They belong to the citizens who had control over who can travel them and who cannot travel the roads. Grant refused to comply. While Krogan was securing peace with the Indians at Fort Pitt, the citizens of Cumberland County continued to patrol the roads in search for illegal goods. When word reached James Smith that Lieutenant Grant was riding on the road, he and four black boys ambushed him and took him prisoner. They marched him into the wilderness for a night and threatened to take him to the wilds of Carolina and drop Grant off in the middle of nowhere. When Grant believed them, he agreed to sign a bond agreeing to give up the guns he still had stored here at Fort Loudoun within five weeks or he would have to pay 40 pounds as a fine. He was released and returned back to Fort Loudoun where he kept the guns and refused to honor the bond since he said it was signed under duress. On May 29, 1765, Thomas Romberg, a Highlander at Fort Loudoun, who was out searching for the missing Lieutenant Grant, who was captured the day before, said he stumbled across an advertisement upon the public road. When he arrived back at the fort after Lieutenant Grant was returned, he told Grant of his find. Grant requested a copy, which Romberg testified that he made because the original was stained with dirt. Romberg destroyed the original copy of the advertisement and gave Grant a copy of it that was in his handwriting. Romberg's copy read the following. These are to give notice to all our loyal volunteers, to those that has not yet 
enlisted. You are to come to our town, and come to our tavern, and fill your bellies with liquor, and your mouth with swearing, and you will have your pass. But if not, your back must whipped, and your mouth be gagged. You need not be discouraged at our last disappointment, for our justice did not get the goods in their hands as they expected, or we should all have a large bounty. But our justice has wrote to the governor, and everything clear on our side, and we will have Grant, the officer of Loudon, whipped or hanged, and then we will have orders for the goods, so we need not stop. What we have our mind and will do for the governor will pardon our crimes, and the clergy will give us absolution. And the country will stand by us, so we may do what we please, for we have law and government in our hands, and we have a large sum of money raised for our support. But we must take care that it will be spent in our town, for our justice gives us, and that have a mind to join us, free toleration for drinking, swearing, Sabbath breaking, and any outrage what we have a mind to do. To let those strangers know their place. It was first possess Blackstown, and we move it to Squire Smithstown. And now I think I have the right to call it, and will still remain till our pleasure. And we call it Hellstown in Cumberland County, the 25th of May, 1765, Peters Township. Your scripture says that the devil is the father of lies, but I assure you, this is the plain truth what I say. God bless our brave, loyal volunteers, and success to our hell's town. Clearly, the wording in this advertisement is written like a parody. And the need for advertisements in May of 1765 was not really needed, since it seemed everyone was on board with the actions of the black boys movement in this area. So it was pretty clear that this uh, advertisement was a fake. The question was, who faked it? Was it the traitors? The Highlanders, an extra flamboyant local, no one really knew. But Justice William Smith pursued Romberg since the only hard copy of the advertisement was in Romberg's handwriting, which pointed to him creating a fake advertisement and using the story of finding it on the road and it being dirty to cover up the fact that it was in his handwriting. With William Smith's allegations towards Romberg, many suspected Romberg as the culprit. While the dispute over the advertisement was hitting the desks of so many people, Krogan's successes at Fort Pitt with an established peace with the Indians encouraged Governor Penn and his council to consider what to do with the No Trade Proclamation. Should Pennsylvania open trade to the Indians? The governor made his decision. Governor Penn, on considering the advances Krogan made with the Indians at Fort Pitt and a former peace treaty signed on May 8th, decided to issue a proclamation reversing his previous proclamation on no trade with the Indians. The new rule stated that from and after the 20th day of June instant, all intercourse and trade with the several nations and tribes of Indians in amenity with the crown of Great Britain and living under His Majesty's protection shall be free and open to all persons residing in this province who shall apply for and obtaining my license to carry on such trade under the provisions and restrictions mentioned in the said royal proclamation. And whereas sundry persons have at several times lately assembled themselves in armed bodies on the western frontiers of this province and have in a most riotous and illegal manner presumed to interrupt the passage of all kinds of goods to Fort Pitt by which the garrison there has been greatly distressed and that small parties are now encamped and lying in wait for the same purpose on the road of communication to that post. I do hereby strictly charge and command all persons whatsoever so assembled forthwith to disperse themselves and desist from all such illegal proceedings and practices. I do further enjoin and require all magistrates, sheriffs, and other officers to use their utmost endeavors at all times to quell and suppress all riots, tumults, and disorderly proceedings tending to disrupt 
the peace and quiet his majesty's subjects and also to be aiding and assisting in discovering and apprehending all persons that may be in any manner concerned therein that the offenders may be persecuted according to due course of law given under my hand in the great seal of the said province at Philadelphia the fourth day of June in the fifth year of his majesty's reign and in the year of our lord 1765 John Penn, God save the king. Trade was now open to the Indians, which no longer gave the black boys and the inhabitants of the frontier a legal reason to maintain their patrols of the roads. But for some time after this proclamation took effect, the black boys still waylaid and inspected pack trains for illegal trade goods. Even though the locals of the time and historians truly believe the advertisement to be faked, the governing officials of Pennsylvania and the British military at the time did not take it lightly. General Thomas Gage was furious. He forwarded a copy of the advertisement to Governor Penn, expressing urgency for Penn to do something. Gage wrote to Penn that it seemed that the inhabitants of Cumberland County were in an actual state of rebellion and that they were supported by the justices. Penn called for his counsel to meet on the meeting and upon some discussion it was decided Penn would write to the justices of Cumberland County and demand a full account of the behavior of the citizens by collecting affidavits and sworn testimony. He believed the advertisement may have been written by Justice William Smith, being it refers to his town as Hell's Town. So he wrote a special letter to Justice Smith dated June 27, 1765. Sir, I am to inform you that you have been lately charged with having encouraged and protected the rioters in Cumberland County in their illegal and disorderly proceedings, and that you have suffered your house to be made their place of rendezvous. This was complained of by Lieutenant Grant and Justice Maxwell to Lieutenant Colonel Reed. As it is necessary for your own honor and my satisfaction that you should clear up the matter if it can be done, I do require you to appear before me at Philadelphia on Tuesday, the 30th day of July next, to answer these new charges, on which occasion I have also required Justice Maxwell to be here. I am, sir, your most obedient, humble servant, John Penn. Justice William Smith was summoned to argue his case before the governor and he accepted with open arms. The justices' hands were forced to deliver testimony on the matters occurring in Cumberland County, and Justice William Smith needed to build his case. On July 18, 1765, the justices of Cumberland County met here at Fort Loudoun. Now, Lieutenant Grant refused to allow the party to enter the fort since members of the party, which included Justice Smith, uh, personally assaulted his fort, his men, and or his own person. Upon protest by Justice Smith, Justice Campbell of Shippensburg agreed to move the proceedings to a nearby house outside the fort, uh, and that satisfied Grant. The proceedings focused on the creator of the advertisement and examining the actions of Justice James Maxwell, who was on the side of the Highlanders and traders, and the actions of Justice William Smith, who seemed to be on the side of the black boys. Fort Loudoun Garrison member Thomas Romberg gave sworn testimony saying once again he found the advertisement on the road, copied it, and destroyed the original. That was the story he stuck with. Henry Prather made mention of some of the proceedings but makes an interesting statement where he says that the justices sworn in certain individuals by making them swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer all such questions as should be asked. But other individuals, especially ones who agreed with Justice Smith's conduct in the affair, were only sworn to tell the truth and nothing but the truth without mentioning the whole truth and answer to such questions as should be asked. This suggests that the justices 
may not have been completely fair. On July 30th, 1765, Justice William Smith meets Governor Penn along with Justice James Maxwell. Maxwell represented the traders' interests and Smith represented the locals' interests. The exact discussion of this meeting has been lost to history, but it appears that Smith won the case and convinced Governor Penn of their legality because William Smith returned as a justice of the county without losing his job and the fact that Lieutenant Grant told Gage that he was greatly concerned to find that complaints should have been made against me to your excellency by Governor Penn. Grant was accused of taking high bribes from Colander for saving the goods. He was also accused of not acting on a warrant issued for the arrest of Sergeant McGlasson, which he was supposed to obey under civil law. He was also accused of obstructing the inquest into the advertisement by not allowing the justices to meet with inside the fort. Grant was also lambasted for detaining the nine guns he stored inside Fort Loudoun, that which were private property, seized without a warrant, and still detained after a grand jury acquitted the owners of wrongdoing. General Thomas Gage, however, always took Grant's side in this, in this dispute, saying he was blameless in the affair. The result of the meeting, whether a secret agreement was made or not, was good for all around, except for Lieutenant Grant and Blackwatch at Fort Loudoun. Justice William Smith maintained his job. James Smith and the other black boys were not brought to trial or served jail time. In general, the patrols and inspections along the road ceased and peace was reached with the Indians in the West. Grant and his men were lambasted for their behavior by Governor Penn, but they were also not formally punished under the law. Neither were Colander, Krogan, or any other traitor for their behavior. Once Justice Smith returned from his successful trip to Philadelphia, he targeted Thomas Romberg with a warrant to get him to admit to being the author of the notorious advertisement that caused a lot of this mess. The Sheriff of Cumberland County served the writ to Romberg, who immediately went to Smith to settle it with hopes of not being carted off to a Carlisle jail. Justice Smith said it could be settled if Romberg would tell Smith who offered the advertisement. Romberg still stuck with his story of finding it, which Smith said, the law will condemn you, that you are the author. Justice Smith said he pitied Romberg for being so ignorant of the law. Romberg replied with, all that they or you can do to me would be to hang me or send me out the country. No, said Smith but it will cost you some money. Mr. Christie and Mr. McCormick, who were other fellows within the room at the time, which was either here at uh, Smith's house, uh, at this location, or at Cunningham's Tavern down the street, began to talk to each other, which prompted Justice Smith to say, gentlemen, none of your whisperings upon this affair. Bromberg wrote directly to General Gage, asking for protection from Justice William Smith in hopes that the British military would protect him from the local lawmen. Krogan and what trade goods he had sailed on two boats on the Ohio River just 25 miles south of modern day Cincinnati where his expedition was indeed going well. Krogan's party, while camped on the banks of the river on June 8, 1765, was attacked by 80 Kickapoo and McCotton warriors at daybreak. These natives were previously allied with the French and distrust the English in which Krogan was representing, of course. This resulted in killing or wounding the majority of Krogan's men, a lot of goods being stolen and a lot of loss of, of equipment. Krogan received the tomahawk wound to the head. Now Krogan wrote, I got the stroke of a hatchet on the head, but my skull being pretty thick, the hatchet would not enter. So you may see a thick skull is of service on some occasions. While recovering from his wound, Krogan was able to successfully negotiate a treaty with the tribes that attacked him.
to agree to the British occupation of Illinois, proving his skills at Indian relations. In July, Krogan negotiated with Chief Pontiac, and in August, negotiated peace with all Indian tribes that were present at the meeting. Thanks to Krogan, Pontiac's war was officially over. Despite still facing charges for shipping illegal trade goods through Pennsylvania on a military pass, in March, Krogan visited General Gage in New York City in October. Krogan was a hero and now could not be touched. A skill that got Krogan out of so much trouble before and now worked once again. But there was still one final thing that had not been resolved, and that was the nine guns that Grant still held at Fort Loudoun. Private property of the inhabitants of the Conakajig settlement, seized illegally by Grant's Highlanders.